I think you're right. No, and he said it's pretty good. good. I, so right after the Spanish. Are we okay? Yeah. All right. Are we, we good to go? Right the radio. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's oh. call to order. Oh. <laughs> Wednesday, August 21st, Board of Directors meeting, otherwise known as the Big Show. Dr. Cog, welcome, people. You are one of the few, the proud, the people, the board members that are here tonight. Uh, let's um, do the pledge. of the United States of America, public for one nation under God, justice for all. <laughs> Next item roll call, Connie. It would do it. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker. Here. Lise Jones, Deb Gardner, David Beacom. Andy Wheelock, George Marlin, Nicholas, Kevin Flynn, here. Roger Partridge, here. Ron Engels, Libby Zabo, Bob Pfeiffer, John Marriott, Bob Roth, Allison Hill, Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Sam Wheat, Margot Ramsden, Lee Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Tammy yes. Maurer, Carrie Penaloza, Jeremy Fay, Katie Brown, Russell Stewart, Bill Christie, Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, Conklin, <laughs> Linda Olson, Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Daniel Dick, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Storm Glore, Jim Dale, here. Ron Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Danny Gutwein, LeBure, Isaac Levy, Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Larry Strzok, President, Paul, John Peck, Ashley, Annie Sullivan, Barney Drystack, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, John Foray, Chris Larson, Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Black, Andy Hammerly, Jessica Sand, Peter Batchison, Here. Ed Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Here. Rebecca White, Et. Bill Van Meter, <laughs> right. uh, Next item, I need a motion to approve the agenda. I have a motion by Herb, a second by Ashley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Abstain? Motion carries. All right, next item. Community Spotlight, City of North Glen. Would you like to introduce? E. All right. Oh, there we go. Hi. Now uh -oh. it's all over the place. All right. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I know. So I really like to um, introduce Brooke. He's um, our what are, the director of planning and development. and development. I knew there was another one on that. Um, and so we are very excited to be here tonight to share what's going on in our beautiful city. So thank you so much, Brooke, for being here. Great. Thank you all, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the amazing transformation that's been taking place in Northland over the last several years. Um, I'll start out by saying that the staff here gave me a hard 10, which I will say for a planner is like almost impossible, but I will do my best to uh, endeavor. And by the way, there is no animation, no video, I'm sorry, but I will be as animated as possible, hopefully carry the crowd here. So moving on here, uh, we're celebrating 50 years. Uh, this is our 50-year anniversary. Uh, North Glen's been widely known in the North for its arts and theater, uh, our events and parks, and the strong history that we have in sort of fostering what's happened in the North. I would point out that our food truck carnival, um, which is only in its fourth year, we are averaging about 50,000 participants uh, with this. It is a regional draw, and if you haven't been to it, it's Mother's Day weekend, rain or shine. Okay. The keyboard just froze up. Oh, hold on. There we go. We're good. Okay. Uh, demographics. So we have about 39,000 people. 
350,000 is our median home price, 14,000 housing units, 9,600 of those are actually single family residential, the rest are multifamily. Median age is 34 and it's continuing to drive downward. Um, our median income is also rising, uh, which is really interesting and exciting. We're also seeing a major transformation in our demographics. Uh, our aging population is actually dwindling and our younger population is increasing. And also we're seeing a large jump in Hispanic population. One of the big catalysts to this that we've also done in a deeper dive is that uh, in the last 10 years of our single family housing product, we have 9,600 as I mentioned, 4,800 uh, properties have transacted over the last 10 years and we've seen an increase in property valuation of over 100%. Sorry, I, for some reason, keep hitting the pad and brings up an escape. Economic development. Um, one of the big things that first started us off in our transformation is Webster Lake Promenade, um, also known as 120th and I-25. Uh, some of you may know that we've had several failed attempts, and on the third try, we hit a home run with the promenade. Um, it's a 57,000 square foot retail development with 350 new jobs. It was catalytic uh, for the community because across the street, um, which was also both Webster Lake and uh, SCL were uh, urban renewal projects. Um, a 60,000 square foot hospital and medical office, it's 28,000 square feet of MOB. Um, with that, it's completely leased out. The commercial property office building next to it has recently sold and is also gonna be tur turned over into medical office. These are all high paying jobs uh, in the North area. In the same frame, we also had Carrick Bend, um, our first residential development in 12 years. Think about that for a second in your communities. When was the last time you had a 12-year gap in housing? Uh, for us, um, it was 12 years, and we basically are 98% rented out. That 1,500 to 2,500 rental rate um, is for one and two bedroom apartments. Um, our next project that was also very instrumental in redevelopment was our Garland Center. It was a 45-year-old uh, aging strip mall with a 5% vacancy rate. We turned it into a Walmart neighborhood grocer. One of the exciting things about this project is we had a food desert in our community, and this really helped fill that. The community also warmly embraced this project for that reason and has been very vital and helpful um, in serving our, our low to moderate income population in the immediate area. Huron Center, another project that also stayed idle for many, many years. Also another food desert, which is now anchored by a Save-A-Lot and an AutoZone, um, a $10 million redevelopment project that had greenfield and uh, significant drainage issues that we were able to address with this project. North Glen Marketplace, as all you know, the big retail power center that used to be the North Glen Mall, opened in uh, 01, it foreclosed in 11, and recently in 2018 came under new ownership. The information down here is how much retail was generated between 2006, 2000 and 2016. It's interesting for, to point out that this is a significant part of our general fund revenue and a, a very vital part of our property, our community and retail uh, properties. With that, we are embarking on um, a $28 million joint venture public-private partnership with our URA, who's contributing $28 million for an entertainment district. If I had a laser pointer, see I'm gonna be animated now, uh, I'd be pointing over to the far right of the, of the image. We're gonna be developing an entertainment district, which will be anchored by Harkins Theaters, and we're gonna be putting in inline, unique, uh, uh, end of food service, uh, high-end uh, type food service product that we're looking to um, engage with Marketplace. And I had mentioned that this is phase one, we're looking forward to phase two. With that, we've also been busy, not just with ED, but also long-range planning, and where we're trying to create vision into action and the first project I'll talk about is the 112th uh, Stationary and Master Plan, which was a joint planning effort with the city of Thornton and Northland, um, in which Northland had actually a very small portion of area uh, in the immediate area of undeveloped land, but nonetheless, it's a mixed-use uh, development type of a project. With that, we looked at multimodal connectivity, um, how we would maximize existing trails and roadway networks. Also on the Northland side, we took a deeper dive to the southwest, which is our industrial park, 220 acres, 99% leased out, which as you all know is a big thing in industrial. However, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, entrepreneurial flex space in the north half of the property. And so we're looking at that as one of our next phases of implementation and development. Also, um, I'm also very proud to announce that on our five acres that we have in the master plan that's unbuilt, um, we're actually looking at filling the missing middle housing product with that, where it very well will be the very first mid-rise housing uh, owner-occupied condo of about 200 units on that 
uh, five acres. And this is the type of, we also have mixed use on the main floor of that, of that project. But very excited about that as far as where that's coming and going. Uh, next big master planning project is Civic Campus, also at 120th and I-25, right next to Webster Lake Promenade. Um, this is sort of our vision. Do we need to stop for that or? Okay. Oh, it's the flash, flash flood, flash flood, flash flood. <laughs> By the way, that doesn't take away from my time. I just want you to know that. All right. <laughs> Moving on. So. Civic Campus Master Plan, um, directly across the street from E.B. Rains Park, um, which is really, by and large, by our community, is considered the heart of the city. And we don't have a downtown, we don't have a main street, so with this project, we're really trying to create a sense of place. This is sort of the imaging that we're looking at as far as what potentially could happen. We're actually in the process of implementing phase one, which is building a new senior rec theater center. Um, it's a $50 million project with $12 million in infrastructure to set up for our P3, which we hope to be announcing here in Q2 of next year, what our rollout for that will be. Very excited. Um, also, um, one of the first major uh, capital projects for the city in a long time. But I will get to the other one here in the very next slide. This is uh, one of the renderings of what the facility will look like. Also, I'd be remiss in not mentioning our Justice Center, which you can all see from I-25 and Community Center Drive. Um, this project actually was part of the Civic Campus Master Plan in which we were looking to see whether or not this use fit on the site. It did not. It was part of a catalyst to move this off over to that property, and it's now uh, up and open. It's a beautiful facility. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Our last master plan, Carl's Farm. It's the last greenfield development in the city of Northland. We're seven square miles. We are 99.9% uh, built out, and this is the last 63-acre greenfield project we have in the community. We did a master plan. We recently got it entitled. We're likely to see uh, the project coming out of the ground uh, first quarter of next year. It's six to 800 residential units with mixed use and retail. One thing I will mention is that one of the things up for consideration tonight under the tip is 120th. Um, we were actually able to P3 our local match with the developer. Uh, to help bring our application forward for that TIP application. So we're very excited about the roadway improvements that are going to be occurring along 120th. Also, this project will be addressing that missing middle housing that we have in the north. Um, we'll be looking at uh, the sort of slot homes and also the multifamily mixed use. Planning projects, and guess what? My last slide, and I'm going to beat the 10 minute time frame. So completed projects. Um, in the same frame of doing all this ED and all this long range planning, we also updated our zoning code. Uh, we did a bike ped mobility plan, a sustainability and greenhouse gas inventory, a city fiscal sustainability assessment. And in addition to that, we've also been developing and fostering a very robust, healthy eating and active living. Um, so what's up next? We're gonna take all of this effort and put it into a new comp plan and really look at what the next generation, the next iteration for this community will be moving forward. And with that, I will thank you for the opportunity to talk about all the wonderful things in Northland. Thank you. Uh, so you're probably waiting in with bated breath, who are the next cities? Uh, I've been told uh, Lakewood and Longmont are the next cities. Hello. Right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there she is. Okay. All right, uh, next item, report of the chair. Uh, report on the Regional Transportation Committee, Mr. Rex. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. Um, the action items that you have in front of you tonight were discussed at the Regional Transportation Committee meeting as well, and they both received a recommendation uh, for approval for, for your action tonight. Um, there was also one other action item, is the confirmation of um, uh, some of the, oh boy, that doesn't sound good. Some of the confirmation of TDM, non-motor and business economic development special interest seats on, on, on the TAC. And the information items, there's front range passenger rail presentation and the BRT presentation that you'll see this evening. Great. Thank you. Uh, report on performance and engagement committee, Director Stolzman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, if anyone does get a tornado warning, I would move to the interior of the building. <laughs> so just let us know. Let us know as well, too. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, this evening we had the performance and engagement committee meeting. We started talking about the annual performance evaluation of our executive director. It's an annual process where we collect feedback from uh, staff members, the board of directors itself, and then peer community. So we're just launching that now and we'll be evaluating him later in the year. Thank you. Uh, report of the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We had four action items that we uh, just went through before this meeting. A uh, resolution to authorize um, the Executive Director to accept funding from the Colorado Department of Human Services for our Aging and Disability Resource Center for Colorado in an amount of up to $400,000. I believe we ex ex anticipate at least three hundred and possibly up to $400,000. A second uh, resolution authorizing the ED to accept funding of 125000 from the Colorado Refugee Services Program for Dr. Cog's Elder Refugee Program. And I think Jayla informed us that we're looking at expanding that into some new territory as well, into a Green Valley Ranch, currently in Aurora. And uh, third item, discussion of a resolution, and we authorized, in fact, uh, the amending a contract with our, our right-click solutions, our provider for the way to go, a route matching program, and, and we have a, up to three years uh, extension on that. And that's to match people with the, with the uh, VAM program, the way to go program. Um, finally, a resolution authorizing uh, Doug to negotiate and execute a contract with CDOT for our planning funds. And it, that included an interesting discussion on the use of, um, of matching funds from RTD from some of their planning activities that we can count toward our cash match. It actually saves us about 75% of our cash match requirement to CDOT. So thank you to RTD. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a presentation of the five-year service award to Director Stolzman. Um, who else has been here five years? Roger, okay. So uh, we're, we're welcoming Ashley into our group, but we're also realizing that we cannot talk any other board member into coming down here on Wednesday nights. <laughs> us us five-year people. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chairman, are you planning on mentioning the clock they have? Yes. Uh, we, uh, uh, Director Stolzman has a lovely uh, carving of Mount Evans. Uh, the, the, the older uh, five-year members got this clock. This clock. So if anybody wants to trade up Ashley for the clock, wins. it's an antique. I'm, I'm more than willing to discuss after the meeting tonight. <laughs> Bob Ross has got the first trade. <laughs> He's dying to trade. Bob's not here, Herb. I know. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to protect you. I'd just like to thank everybody that I've served with. I've, I've really learned a lot from this organization. It has really excellent members from each community that are sent down. It's been a tremendous opportunity. I think we've done a lot for our region together, and I look forward to seeing what we'll continue to do in the future. And it's just phenomenal staff, really. I'd like to thank the staff, and I've just seen some incredible performance over the last five years. So I thank you all. Nice. Next item report of the executive director, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so board workshop, I'm really looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible up at the board uh, workshop up in Keystone this next this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, just a reminder that if you're attending the Friday afternoon sessions, they start at two o'clock and you're going up in the hills on a Friday afternoon, so uh, plan accordingly. You know, traffic can be a real bear this, uh, this well, any time of year, who are we kidding? Um, and we're also getting quite a few posters. Brad, I don't know what the num count is, up around 20 or so? Yeah, uh, for, from, from your communities, highlighting some of your projects. So thank you all very much, and please thank your staff. They're a highlight. I think they're always a, always a big hit at the, at the board retreat, so thank you very much. Um, we are planning on having a September board work session on September 4th in this room at 4 p.m. Uh, public transportation is the topic. Uh, Dave Genova, general manager and CEO of RTD, will be here to talk about two important RTD initiatives. The uh, Reimagine RTD, which is a two-year project to understand current and future public transportation needs in the Denver metropolitan area. And um, they just finished a, a Fast Tracks Unfinished Corridors report. And so Dave is going to report out on that as well. Um, we're also, pro the possibility of a uh, uh, presentation on the Front Range Passenger Rail be different than the ones that you guys have seen in the sub-regional meetings, um, but we're, that's, uh, that's tentative right now. 
Citizens Academy, at your table, you do have a flyer that talks about our Fall Citizens Academy. Classes begin on September 17th, and, and it's, they meet every Tuesday evening for seven weeks. The deadline for that is Friday, August 23rd. So if you know anyone that's, that, you know, residents, citizens that, um, that attend your council meetings maybe, or our county commission meetings, um, that you would think may, maybe would uh, be well served with some uh, information about some regional initiatives and, and how everything kind of works together in uh, collaboration and, and cohesively. Uh, please reach out to them. Uh, we would love, love to have them. We, uh, I must say, I, I really, truly would like to give a shout out to uh, to our staff, uh, Lisa and Brad and and Steve, for the work that they've done on this. It's it's really, really gone over well. The first two sessions that we've done. So thank you guys very much. Uh, Metro Vision Idea Exchanges, our next in-person idea exchange, which will be co-hosted by CU Denver, will be held on September 5th. The uh, September session will detail investments in and economic benefits of our region's outdoor amenities. Um, and you can find additional information on our website associated with that, but I know we've been sending out some, uh, some email reminders and the like too. So please, if you're so inclined, we'd love to have you attend that. And just on a related note, we do also, um, you know, we have a webinar series as well. And those have been really well attended. We're getting 80 to 100 people that sign up for those. For those, so uh, we would encourage you to uh, pass along that information when you do receive it to to staff as well. Um, they're valuable opportunities, and um, I think they're incredible learning opportunities. So please consider um, setting up for those. A uh, reminder for our smaller communities, our Small Communities Hot Topics Forum is uh, scheduled for Thursday, September 26th in this room uh, from 10 to 3, 3 p.m. Um, and the topic this year, again, is how to play in the smart city, how to play in the smart city game. So we uh, would love to have you attend that. Uh, there we have a, there's a grant opportunity through the, the Rose Community Foundation, which is one of our primary partners in keeping older adults connected and engaged in their communities. Um, the, the, uh, the, the funding is, is for to advance age-friendly communities uh, work in our region. So at your tables, you'll, you'll find an announcement related to the current opportunity. Eligible applicants include local governments uh, within the foundation's seven county region and uh, community partners that are working closely with local government. So please, uh, please have a look at that. Uh, the deadline is August 30th, so next, next Friday. Um, we are also planning on a call for projects, this is again for the smaller communities and quite frankly, the non-MPO communities. So communities within Clare Creek and Gilpin counties, as well as in uh, Adams, and Arapahoe County, counties east of Kiowa Creek, right? So the communities that lie outside of the MPO area. Um, so part of the uh, uh, our TIP allocation this year, which was a one-time uh, state funding source, it was the Multimodal Options <coughs> Fund. You guys, remember that? It's about Todd, about forty-five million dollars or so. So we so we we proportionally allocated that within the MPO and the the non-MPO section because the money was given to the entire Dr. Cog area, and we did that by population. So um, so we have five hundred thousand dollars that are available for those two counties and the par par parts of the counties that I mentioned in Adams and Arapahoe County, and. Um, so the grants do require a 50% match, and we expect to announce that call for projects on uh, early September, September 3rd, and running through October 24th. Um, there is a training component that is required for, for communities and counties that are considering uh, applying for this. However, if um, you've already attended the training as part of the TIP, present, uh, tip uh, uh, process, then you don't have to attend this training session. Uh, and that training session is going to be held on September 11th from 9 to 11 at uh, Idaho Springs City Hall. We'll be sending out additional information. Don't worry about it, but we just want to give you a heads up that it's coming. <coughs> and last but not least, um, I, I'm pretty sure you guys received a briefing on the Regional Vision Zero uh, plan. Uh, that we have going on. And we're receiving quite a bit of attention from the media on this. There was a Streets blog article that was done uh, earlier last week, I believe, and uh, Channel 9 did a news story on it last night or the night before last, a couple, couple nights ago. Um, and Jacob Rieger was, uh, was 
um, was highlighted in both of those those um, media requests, and he did he did a fantastic job. I don't think Jacob's here tonight, but he did a fantastic job of representing all of us um, in those in those um, um, in those media requests. Um, we staff, I mean, we've really done a truly a great job thus far in working. We're working with your communities to establish. We have a, a work group established and working through all the details of this. Our own uh, communications and marketing staff, as well as some, our, some, some folks within our transportation planning and operations staff, um, have put together a video. It was all produced in-house. It was created and produced in-house. And that was kind of the, the impetus for the media attention that we have gotten. So what I'd like, for, like to do real quickly is to show you that video. It's only a couple minutes long, but I think it's, uh, it's well done, and I think you will appreciate it. Guessing maybe fifteen hundred. A couple hundred. I don't know. Say a thousand. Uh, probably over a few dozen. I'd have to say. Drunk driving. Alcohol related. Texting and driving. Road rage. I would say sadly not. No. Probably not. Uh, I'm hoping for that. Hundred, hundred and fifty. Uh, I think less than a hundred. But how could you quantify such a thing? None. I mean, nobody needs to die. There's no reason for it. Zero. Zero. Ah, uh, zero. Absolutely. <laughs> zero. Zero. Yeah. Zero. Yeah, they should shoot for that. Absolutely. Ideally, yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Obviously, yeah, zero would be the best goal. So there you go. It's very well done. I hope you agree. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of it. And we're sharing it on all of our social, social media platforms. If you, if you see an opportunity for us to share that with you, maybe on your public, public uh, uh, channel or whatever, we'd be happy to share that information. So please just get in touch with me or Steve Erickson on staff. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next item, public comment. We have up to 45 minutes allocated for public comment. Each speaker is probably limited to three minutes. Any public comment tonight? Seeing none, we will close public comment at 7 o'clock. Next item is, uh, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move. Uh, I have a motion from Herb. Second from Kevin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Abstain? Motion carries. On to the action items. Uh, item number 10, a discussion of a resolution to adopt the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, Mr. Cottrell.
All right, so if you're following along, we are, we are at attachment B, and um, the, the action and recommendation that we're looking for um, this evening um, is uh, three, do uh, three documents. Um, okay. I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I didn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyhow, it is about three documents, the, the Transportation Improvement Program and two air quality conformity, uh, do, uh, conformity determination documents, though all three of those are linked within your memo, uh, attachment B. There is also two other documents that you should be aware of that are also linked. Um, one is a summary of the written and oral testimony for the public comment period that ended a month ago. And then also there's an errata sheet that outlines the changes that took place from the public hearing version to the action draft, which you have linked um, here this evening. All right, so what is the TIP? Um, the TIP is a short range <laughs> planning program identifying the real projects that are contained out there for the next four years. All the funding associated with the projects must be fiscally constrained both federally with the federal and the state funding. Uh, this document and program are, is federally required and uh, is updated every two years. So a new TIP is produced every two years. Although the Dr. Cog um, project selection process takes place every four years. So every other TIP, we do select a new round of projects to be included in that. The TIP contains projects that were selected not only by Dr. Cog, but also our two other planning partners, CDOT and RTD. And of course, it, help, it helps implement MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, on this screen, there's four types of funding that Dr. Cog allocates. Uh, the first three have been around for numerous years, though the, the, uh, the actual titles of those programs might have changed slightly. The last um, is one that uh, Doug actually mentioned earlier, the State Multimodal Transportation Options Fund. Um, Dr. Cog's staff believes this to be a one-time um, influx of funding and uh, is a new state source um, from the 2018 Senate Bill 1. So over the past four years, Dr. Cog's staff and of course the committees and the board have worked very hard to, to work and, and change up our uh, project selection process. So in the past, um, in previous tips, it was very uh, centralized, where the calls, the calls for projects were issued by Dr. Cog, and of course the applications came back, and of course the Dr. Cog board made those final decision. Um, with this new dual model process, this process, project selection process was actually split into two, the regional share and the sub-regional share. Um, regional share takes on a lot of the characteristics of the centralized process, but the sub-regional share was expanded to allow local input and local values into the application process. Kind of a summary of the regional share, um, which was conducted um, the middle of last year. Eight projects were selected with approximately $32 million worth of Dr. Cog allocation. Uh, this provided $179 million worth of total transportation investment once local mass was figured in. Uh, as a summary for the sub-regional share, which took place earlier this year, uh, 82 projects were selected um, with an allocation of $209 million. And of course, this provided over a half billion dollars in investment um, through the local match and overmatch. The next two slides outline kind of a summary of the $285 million um, that was allocated through this TIP. Um, the first is the funding allocation by project type. And the second is the percentage by project type. I think one big thing to take away from these two slides is the increase in the bike and pet allocation for the amount of funds that we had. Um, going back, there was $51 million, which was a slight increase by about 10 to $15 million. And percentage-wise, it was an increase of approximately 10% over our historical bike and pet average. Um, one thing to really point out, within the roadway operational and the roadway capacity projects, most of those projects do also contain a bike pet element, which is not figured into that dollar amount or that percentage. Uh, projects in the TIP must also pass emission budgets for three mobile sources that were listed here at the top, ozone, carbon monoxide, and PM10. Um, and work combined with Dr. Cog through the runs of the travel model 
and with the state through the completion of mi uh, mission calculations, all, um, all, all mission budget tests uh, passed. Um, public input is also a vital component of the process. Um, the public hearing that took place uh, before you a month ago was, was the capstone of this process. Um, throughout the 30-day public he uh, hearing, um, the, this comment period, the notifications were passed through the normal sites, such as the website, social media, and newspaper. But we've also introduced a couple additional sources, um, like interactions with Bike to Work Day and the introduction of an online web map where comments could be directed specifically to individual projects. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes the remarks that I have, and I'd be happy to take any comments or, you qu or questions that you may have. Questions for Todd? Comments? <clears throat> First trading? That's an old, an old comment. Sorry. I was kind of hoping that Eva was here, but um, all right. Uh, with with nothing, uh, I'll entertain a motion. A motion from uh, Director Williams. Second. Hour. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Abstain? Congratulations. We now have a tip. Hey. <laughs> Next item, uh, discussion of eligibility rules and evaluation process for selecting the non-infrastructure marketing outreach and research projects to be funded through the TDM services set aside of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. Erickson. Good stormy evening and thank you. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Erickson. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director here at Dr. Cog. And in that role, uh, one of the best things I get to do is oversee the Way to Go program. And that's our uh, regional transportation demand management program and partnership. So I'm here today to talk to you about uh, the fiscal year 2020-2021 transportation demand management set aside, and specifically to talk about the eligibility rules and process. I'll give one update from uh, what was in your packets um, when we sent the uh, agendas out about a week ago. We had not gotten uh, this to the Regional Transportation Committee as an action uh, item, but we did that uh, yesterday morning, and so we now have uh, unanimous approval from both RTC and, and TAC on this item. Okay, we have a lag here, that's the storm. So uh, for those of you that may recall, there are set-asides in the TIP, and to Todd was just talking about the TIP in, in greater terms, but if you look at the set-asides, look at that second block down, there's uh, set-asides for TDM services, and one of those set-asides is really to fund the Way to Go program here at Dr. Cog, that's that first bullet point. The second set-aside uh, is to fund our regional partners. We fund seven transportation management associations in the region, and that last bullet point is really what we're talking about tonight. You'll see $1.8 million over a four-year period for non-infrastructure TDM projects. So the purpose of this is to support marketing, outreach, and education, uh, along with research projects that reduce single occupant vehicle uh, travel. So these really should work in concert with the Way to Go program. The program goals would be to reduce traffic congestion and improve our air quality. Oh my gosh, welcome. <laughs> Uh, we're also very interested in piloting uh, new TDM approaches, so we're interested in finding projects that can help on a small scale sort of demonstrate uh, effectiveness and then maybe roll that out across the region. Uh, we support healthy and active choices. Uh, my, my program, Way to Go, may be best known for Bike to Work Day, uh, second largest event of its kind in the country. But really, it's just a small part of what we do year round to support and promote biking and walking, those active choices. And we also want to improve awareness and access for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. Again, I have a 
a leg. I've hit it three times. Okay, so back to the funding that's available. Um, I, sh I mentioned the $1.8 million, that's over a four-year period. So this is a two-year call for projects, so we'll have half of that. If my math is right, that's $900,000. We do have an additional $236,000 that was unallocated in 2019, so the total amount uh, for this call will be $1.136 million. In order to be eligible, uh, the project sponsor has to be eligible uh, to receive direct funds, fed federal funds, uh, needs to um, demonstrate that they're in good standing with the state of Colorado. Uh, all scopes of work must adhere to STBG, Surface Transportation Block Grant Funding Guidelines, and uh, uh, sponsors also have to provide either in-kind or, or cash support as well. So it'll really be a two-step process, starting with a letter of intent, and that's really kind of to get us to the concept stage and then a more detailed uh, application, uh, which will be reviewed by a panel. I'll go into a little more detail, drill down one, one level. This will start, and we're hoping it'll start as, as early as the first week in September, with, if you have folks that are interested in this, a mandatory uh, session where we'll kind of go through a workshop and explain to people what this, what this is about and how they can apply. We'll start identifying the concepts for projects and that's where people will then submit that letter of intent if you're kind of going down the left-hand side here and then snaking back up. Uh, <laughs> we'll review those letters of intent as they come in kind of on a rolling basis, sorry about that. Uh, and then people will submit a formal application, and that's where we'll have a review panel that will uh, review those applications. Uh, then we'll come back through committees and actually recommend a list of projects uh, through the committees and to the full Dr. Cog board. That entire process probably is sort of a September to, I'll say November timeframe. In terms of the review panel, uh, uh, it's important to know we'll have both internal and external folks on that panel. Uh, stakeholders from within Dr. Cog, I'll have my way to go manager a part of that review panel, but we'll have folks from other divisions too, from Area Agency on Aging, Transportation Planning and Operations, and Regional Planning and Development. External stakeholders will include Federal Highways, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation, we hope uh, Colorado Department of of uh, health and environment, and then other um, uh, subject matter experts, probably someone from the Regional Air Quality Council, and we hope RTD. So what will happen with those applications when they come in is we'll ask the people on the review panel to score based on the criteria that's in your packet, and that's uh, section A of, of the packet materials. Separately, Dr. Cog staff will actually uh, be scoring on some data-driven um, metrics as well. So there will kind of be two components to the scoring on it. That panel will get together um, and discuss the, the project scores and ultimately come up with a list of projects, again, that we bring before uh, the committees and the board uh, for approval. Uh, it, just one more layer down in terms of the criteria, and again, there's more detail in your packets, but uh, it's important to know, I think, that 75% of the, 75%, there's gremlins up here in addition to the storm, <laughs> of the, um, the scoring or the weighting will be from that review panel, uh, you know, and if you look at uh, some of the, the, the things that will be most important. These are actually, those bullet points are, are in order of how they're weighted. Not surprisingly, VMT reduction is the number one heaviest weighted thing, uh, level of innovation and uniqueness. And then if you look at the Dr. Cog data-driven scoring, things like short trip opportunity zones and it being in, in environmental justice areas and, and serving de uh, designated Dr. Cog urban centers will be important. So. I think that's my presentation. Uh, it was a bit choppy there, but I'm um, happy to take any questions. Great. Any questions for Mr. Erickson? Yes, Ms. Maurer. Could you tell me what kind of projects you're looking at with this set aside? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I'll, I'll give some examples. This is a little different than some of the, the previous calls for projects, but um, these are, are some that are just kind of in process right now. So we have a casual carpool 
pilot that's taking place along uh, the 36th corridor right now. Uh, there's a bicycle ambassador program uh, here in Denver where the folks at Bicycle Colorado are taking people and you know along some of the active bike corridors and just getting them safe and comfortable in, in terms of riding their bikes. Um, mobility hub uh, at uh, Colorado Station. So those are those are three kinds of examples. One of the reasons we wanted to do this two-step process with that letter of intent is though we want people to come up with some really creative ideas and we can see if we can make that that fit in, into the criteria. Any additional questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Motion from Director Atchison. Second from Director Mullica. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Next item, informational briefings, update to RTD's Regional Bus Rapid Transit Feasibility Study. Uh, Mr. Helfand. Good evening, uh, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, we have another update on RTD's uh, Regional Bus Rapid Transit Plan. Uh, we have uh, Holly Buck from FHU here to uh, provide an update, thanks. Thank you for having us. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say that video is really spectacular. I'm just loving that you're taking initiative on that, it's great. Um, so we were here back in February, and I am looking forward to giving you an update on this regional BRT feasibility study. We've had an opportunity since February to have a lot of dialogue with the local jurisdictions, do a lot of analysis. Um, so we're going to tell you a little bit about, through that process, we've made some changes and shifts to the scope of work and to the outcomes. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight so you can have the latest and greatest information. So the study goal and desired outcome, this is the first place you'll see a modification of the work effort that we've done. Under the desired outcome, you'll see that the very first bullet is develop a district-wide BRT network. So through our conversations with the local jurisdictions, we found that it was really important to identify a broader regional network of bus rapid transit investments. So we had initially started out the scope of work. We were going to identify just a few uh, core corridors that we thought might have potential for Federal Transit Administration small starts funding. And we found out from the communities that they really wanted to see a bigger, broader network. So that's the first difference you'll see in what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then you'll see that the second and third quarters do identify that opportunity for a near term, some near-term investments. And it talks about identifying a few corridors that have potential for that FTA funding. That FTA funding is important because we want to bolster the pot of money coming into the region as best we can with that local and state funding that we have available. So why are we talking about bus rapid transit in the region? So this graphic provides us, a, a, now granted this is, this is um, from the regional travel model, so I don't, don't go quote any exacting numbers here, but it is a great tool to help us understand how, as our communities grow, and that we have people moving in, and we have more congestion on our roads, what might the pressures on RTD's services look like in the future? So we can see from those estimations that you could see the potential for a doubling of demand in those services by the time we get to the year 2040. So it's a lot of investment that would be needed in the region to accommodate all of that demand. So we set about um, on, a, on a process to evaluate corridors throughout the region, and we put together this, this five-step process that we have been going through, and we've evaluated 
corridors based on their ability to attract ridership, um, what the land use looks like today and in the future. We identified areas of congestion today and in the future. And then we looked at physical viability. Do we have space today? Um, available to make a bus rapid transit line? Can we make a dedicated busway or not? And then the last one is really looking at that final evaluation. And this is another area of change through our community input is that we talked initially about having um, the final evaluation and the prioritization, but we've actually removed any prioritization from the exercise because we found that it wasn't really providing any benefit. We really want to support moving the bus rapid transit corridors and network forward for investment as we can with the communities. So a bit of a recap on the stakeholder engagement. Um, we've been, I mentioned that we've been working with RTD's local government and planning group, and they have been really instrumental in helping us you know, craft and sort of refocus the exercise. Um, we've been here, of course, to the Dr. Cog group on a couple of occasions. We went and met with the Colorado Department of Transportation because as you might imagine, many of the corridors are on state highways. Um, so having their input is, is valuable. Um, and we're continuing that process. We had a survey that went out as well through to the local communities. So specifically, let's talk about um, how we made some modifications through that um, stakeholder engagement process. So the first one I talked about, we made, we developed that district-wide regional BRT network, and I'm gonna show you that in the, I think it's the next slide coming up, so we can talk about that. Um, we included language that talks about RTD and the local agencies really partnering and working together to move these forward. There was a concern that it was this corridor or that corridor and that we might be pitting the corridors against each other. And RTD is really in support of moving all these corridors forward and the more local support we have, the better chance we have to do that. Um, a couple of evaluation metrics that were added as a result of some input. People asked about passenger miles of travel um, and reduced stop spacing. This is particularly of interest when you're talking about the suburban communities and you have a longer route where people are traveling longer distances. Routes can rate better and look better if we are looking at a metric like passenger miles of travel because they travel farther on those routes and reduced stop spacing because that improves the travel time. So we added those. Um, the Northwest Area Mobility Study, all of the routes that were included in that Northwest Area Mobility Study have now been included in the regional BRT network, and that was also a result of feedback from the community. Um, we removed phasing from the BRT network. I mentioned that. It just, it really was not providing a benefit to us, so we felt like, why, why would we keep it in there if it's not useful to RTD or to the communities? Um, and then we're gonna talk about, we have two categories in here. Really, we want to identify those corridors that are most promising for local and state funding. And then we've identified those corridors that are promising for local, state, and potentially have um, an opportunity to compete well for Federal Transit Administration small starts funding. So this is the network that has been developed. It's a pretty comprehensive network throughout the region. And uh, we presented this to the local government group with RTD last time. They were pretty pleased with the results that had come and the places that we'd gone and how we got to this location. Um, and I think it, it covers a lot of ground and there's a lot of really terrific corridors on here. A couple of notes about corridors that were of, um, were of particular interest. Um, and how and why they were on here. Clearly we were looking for corridors that had demonstrated potential ridership. Clearly that's important when we're talking about bus service, right? Um, we also included corridors that had shown that they have a partnership in place. So corridors like State Highway 7, they've been working on a lot of, they've been working together, they've developed a, they've received funding, they've moved that that corridor forward, um, that corridor would be on here for that reason. Um, we have corridors on here that have um, shown a demonstrated transit supportive policies. Those have been included in this network as well. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. If you have 
transit supportive land use, they have also been included in this network. So there were several metrics that we looked at to make, to create this um, network of improvements. So then the next piece, of course, so this is the big network. And I think my takeaway from, from the study would be that this is probably, I would say, the most important piece of the work that came out of it. It's not what we started out as our goal, but it's what the goal of the study really ended up being was to develop this network so that we can all be pointed in the same direction of what the, the long-term regional network looks like. Um, the other piece of it is that increasing of the overall pot of money that we have to work with. And that's where we're looking at, okay, which of these corridors has the most potential to go out and compete for federal funds? Federal FTA, Federal Transit Administration funds specifically, because you have a lot of federal funds in the room here. Um, so we went through an evaluation. Again, we're looking specifically at small starts criteria and trying to identify which corridors might be able to move into that process. Um, so we looked here at right-of-way availability, the viability of lane repurposing. Uh, we looked for opportunities where we could create a corridor where at least 50% of the route was dedicated to, to bus lanes. Um, and then, of course, alignment with agencies, policies, and plans. So if there was, um, if, if a community had identified that they were particularly supportive of a bus rapid transit and they have done a study, then that um, would help move that forward and be more competitive for those FTA funds. So this is just an example of the evaluation we went through on tier three, and there's more of these in your packet um, if you wanna look at those. And this shows those corridors that still appeared to have potential to compete well for those FTA funds. So we continued through that process. And we conducted some more evaluation to see which ones might compete the best. I'm gonna just go through these fairly quickly because there's a bunch of detail here, but, um, but Havana, you see, is an outlier. If we continue to work on Havana, we actually don't think that this is a good result for Havana, so, but we're continuing to work on the modeling and try and fix that. Um, we think it's a modeling issue, so we're, we're still working on that. But you can see that we're looking at VMT reduction and we're looking at BRT boardings per revenue mile. Here we're looking at travel time savings. Of course, we want, if we're gonna make the bus work, we have to have some travel time savings. Somebody flagged that I-25 I was low here. That's because we assume that that um, dedicated facility is um, already in place. Our managed lane is already in place all the way up to State Highway 7. If that lane wasn't in place, you probably are, would see, you see about a 10 to 15% travel time savings because that lane is going in. So that is, um, that's a great improvement that's already underway. We looked at technology readiness. We looked at capital costs. This is really important. The improvements that we are looking at tentatively for these corridors, we really tried to stick with. We're repurposing lanes. We're not taking additional right away. We're looking at striping, signing, improved stops for sure, but we're trying to keep the costs low so again, we can go in and really be competitive for those FTA funds. So we're trying to, the, you know, the, the costs are not going in and acquiring new right away. So you'll see that, you know, that these costs seem high, but I'll tell you that like they're low for some BRT projects. We looked at operating and maintenance costs as well, also part of looking at that. Economic development potential, looking at employment, multifamily housing, commercial, this is some of the criteria, if you're familiar with small starts, these are some of the criteria that they're looking at to evaluate those corridors. We look at equity and we have several different, this is showing um, households in poverty, but we look at a variety of different metrics as well to consider equity in the mix. There's a draft of some early um, results. And then our schedule is that we're here with you tonight and we're very happy to be here. And we plan to present the final, uh, the final findings October 8th to the RTD board. And I'd love to hear questions, discussion, comments. Any qu oh, Director Beacom. Mr. Daymore. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I appreciate Highway 7, and uh, I find that 
this was much less confusing to me happening up there at Highway 7. I'm very happy that you've done that, and uh, there's still a long ways to go before we get this all done, but. Yes, thank you. Additional questions? Oh, Director Stolzman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to thank Director Tisdale for coming to the meeting. It really means quite a lot to have uh, the chair of RTD uh, attending. That uh, is a great, great show of support, and I, I'm very thankful for that. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying that public transit's incredibly important to our region. It's very important to the citizens of Louisville, and I take it very seriously. It impacts people's daily lives. It, it impacts the quality of life, people's access to health care, um, school, to their jobs, all kinds of things. So this is very serious, and I'm very glad uh, that we're, we're taking the time to discuss this this evening. Um, so one observation that, that I would uh, reach looking at this report is that if you use this tiered evaluation and the criteria that have been set forth to look at these BRT corridors, I really don't believe that you would actually have executed the US 36 BRT given these criteria. And that's concerning to me because I continually hear people say, well, this is so great, US 36 BRT is so great, you guys have everything you need, you don't need your train that's never coming, you're fine, you have BRT. But now we're looking at these criteria and saying this is what we want to use to decide whether or not we do bus rapid transit. And um, these metrics don't cor correspond to these long trips to suburban areas. And I completely understand the reality that we need to serve trips that have a lot of trips per mile. <coughs> But I think we need to have an open dialogue about, you know, what's the weighting we place on that and what's the weighting you place on coverage. Uh, I'm not sure if I just missed the slide uh, in here or if it was removed because it, because you knew I would have a lot of questions about it, but there was this slide in our packet and maybe it came up tonight on equity. And I think if you look at the, the routes that we're looking at for federal funding, you can see that there are very few, if any, things north of I-70. Uh, and I, you know, sort of look at I appreciate Director Beacom's comment, but I look at it a little differently. I think that slide was put in there as tokenism and to make our area be quiet, and I don't think it actually has any commitment or plan to put any bus rapid transit in the north. So I think there's a real equity issue, uh, and, and I think it's very concerning. Thanks. Director Beacom. Just a clarification. The other morning at the RTC meeting, we had a very about the uh, Highway 7 and the entire northern area and, and the impact it was not receiving for BRT. And uh, general manager for RTD uh, explained a lot of issues as to what was going on, and Mr. Genova clarified a lot that there's two different deals. One is getting the money from the feds and then the money the other ones that would come from the small projects and from the neighborhood. Yesterday's presentation had kind of left out not just the equity issue, but north in reality. And my comment earlier was that they have done a lot since yesterday morning um, to deal with that factor somewhat, considering it wasn't dealt with before. I don't disagree with you. Anything else? Director Daigle. So the only question that I have is, is kind of similar. Why would we stop BRT on federal before you get to Sheridan, the city of Sheridan, when we have very little buses anyway and have people walking along Hampton in order to get to the Inglewood station constantly all the time. They're walking on a highway, basically, to get over to the light rail. Why would you not have BRT go from Dartmouth to Bellevue, which is maybe three miles? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't understand why you would stop there. And that would be my only comment. I would think that you would want to continue all the way to the end of federal, which ends at Bellevue. We can certainly take a look at that. I vote you will. Any other questions? 
the pick. So, uh, thank you. So just piggybacking on that remark, why did you choose the area that you chose and stop at that area? On, on particularly on federal? Yes. Uh, I can tell you on- Well, even on, on yeah. BRT is the total and didn't move north at all. You just stopped at Highway 7 where it is, but you didn't move any further north in the district. Is it, Okay, so that's a good question. So on the, um, we did look at, we actually took a line, if we're talking about I-25 in particular, goes up to State Highway 7. We looked at State Highway 7 up to State Highway 119 and over uh, west into Longmont. We also looked at that corridor. Um, and that corridor did not perform well, which is not from a ridership kind of perspective. And I think that's not as surprising given the density of land use that's currently there and even what's projected is less. Um, but we did look at that. We did look at that particular corridor. Is that is that where you're interested in? Yes, that as well as 287. 287, which part of 287? From uh, Broomfield to Longmont. Let me look here. Let me just think about that. Director Van Meter. While she's trying to pull up perhaps slide seven or so, right. I believe <laughs> that shows the map. I'll note that RTD's district boundaries generally end at the Weld County line, so on the eastern portions of the district, we could not look any farther north. But um, as you can see on this map, perhaps it wasn't clear in the original um, discussion, the white corridors are those that are potentially eligible for federal funding. The blue lines are those that we see as other promising corridors and that are part of the network that Holly was um, describing and discussing. So you can see there is a blue line north along 287 to Longmont. And you can also see uh, different classification for State Highway 119 connecting Longmont and Boulder because we are far along in the um, studies and pro progressing on State Highway 119 bus rapid transit corridor. So focus not just on the white lines, but that network of white plus blue combined. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I have more of a comment, but, you know, historically looking, I think as you drive through Denver, north and south, I think we have a real lack of, of corridors going east and west in the past. And, and I think even looking at this, we're still somewhat overlooking the east and west corridors. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Director Strzok. We agree. Anything else? Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, Director Salzman. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, next month we're going to be talking about the T2 the, and uh, having some more discussion about uh, the Regional Transportation District. So I think that this sort of tees up that discussion, but I think there are real questions about equity to each district, and it would be really fascinating to look at the spend and the revenue from each district broken apart by different characteristics. Um, so whether that's your past program revenue, your fare box, your sales tax revenue, your use tax, and really dig down into understanding the sources and uses of revenue, either by county or by district, to understand how people are putting in versus getting out. Because this is a very big district. There are a lot of different land uses within the district. There's a lot of different masters to serve. I understand that. But I think we need to get a little bit deeper layer of understanding of um, the actual finances of the operation and, and really the, the value back to the residents that we represent so that we can explain, you know, are you getting a value back for this service uh, that's proportional to what you're putting in or is there a different way to accomplish this so that we could have public transit serving our residents for a similar cost with a different mechanism? Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. All right.
Next item is the AAA brief, aging in Denver region, demographics and needs. Ms. Sanchez Warren. Good evening, this is actually a, a team tag. We're gonna tag team you here. Brad Calvert um, is going to talk about the demographics and then I'm gonna talk about the needs. So Brad's up first. Thank you for that. I was going to say, I'm sorry that I'm not, uh, not Jayla, but you are gonna get her here in a second. Um, that is really distracting when you're standing up here, I will, I will admit. Um, so tonight's presentation is part of a series. So last month, if you were at, at the board meeting, uh, Jayla covered really what I would call sort of the AAA basics. Uh, for those that really aren't uh, as aware of what happens at the Area Agency on Aging here at Dr. Cog, really to kind of bring you uh, up, to, up to speed on that. Obviously tonight we're gonna spend some time um, on demographics and really kind of understand the needs uh, that have been identified uh, for older adults uh, throughout the regions using a, a variety of, of ways to capture uh, those needs and really both of these are serving as a primer to the to a really important conversation uh, that you are going to have at the workshop on Saturday morning. So it really was to lay some groundwork so that you can hit the ground because I promise you that is going to be a very interesting and complex conversation. So having a little bit of a of, a, of some groundwork laid over these two presentations, I hope is really helpful. And I will offer you one modest uh, reward for braving the weather tonight. You may or may not get some quiz questions at the workshop that reflect some of the things you heard uh, last month and this month. So if you're really hyper competitive and wanna really show off, you might pay attention tonight and reflect on what you might've learned uh, last month as well. Um, I do wanna just make sure that you are aware, uh, a lot of the material in this presentation is really drawing on three resources that are publicly available and really can help you think through these issues in your own community. Uh, the State Demographer's Office through the Department of Local Affairs produces lots and lots of data uh, related to how demographics are changing in this region. I'm gonna borrow some of their, their information for some of this. Uh, we work on uh, statistically valid surveys of older adults about every three or four years. Uh, so we're leaning on that a little bit and then Jayla works on her version of a long range plan is four years. Uh, so every four years, she is required to think about the needs of older adults throughout the region to ultimately reassess um, how to, to, to focus uh, her work to make sure their needs are being met. So those are really sort of the core uh, resources that we're leaning on for this presentation. Uh, so a little bit about the past. Uh, so you can see from this slide, this is state of Colorado uh, growth by age co cohort uh, from, the, from the years 2000 to 2016. So during that time frame, atta uh, attracted a lot of people in their working age years, let's call it the 20 to, to 35 range. But really look at the slide, all of the sort of true energy related to uh, percent increase in population was really on the older end of the spectrum, right? We are, we are region in change, uh, and this is change that we are now, you know, a decade plus into, but we really are gonna see some additional uh, spikes uh, coming forward. So again, now looking forward uh, by county. So this is a uh, percent increase between the years of 2016 and 2050 uh, for, the, for those age 60 and over. And 60 matters to Jayla and her shop because that's when uh, older adults become eligible for services through the AAA, right? So that's an important number for us. Uh, so you can see a, you know, basically a doubling of that population uh, over the next uh, uh, 25 years or so with some counties experiencing uh, pretty significant differences and variations between how much uh, growth they're experiencing. That is really oftentimes about the number of uh, older adults age 60 and over already in those communities. That's in, anyone who sort of uses stats or percentages, that's one of the things that's driving why you might see some of those uh, numbers that are a little bit lower. But here's the one that maybe matters the most. Uh, so this is that same time period. This is increase in the 75 plus population. And 75 plus is really the important part for us is that is when people oftentimes need services to remain in their home in the community and to live independently. Whether that is uh, supports and services from the AAA, whether that is from uh, family members or neighbors, to live independently you oftentimes need some level of support. And the bottom line here is a 200% increase in the region and every county in the region is gonna experience at least a doubling. And I'm sure Roger noticed a 400 plus uh, percent increase uh, in Douglas County, right? So a, a very true 
uh, age wave, uh, particularly at the 75 plus demographic uh, throughout the entire region. No one is immune uh, from this demographic trend. The other little factoid I like to sort of blow people's minds with, so think about uh, sort of that same time period, just the 95 plus population across the region is going to increase by, let's call it 500%, right? So if 75 plus means you absolutely positively need some level of care or support to remain in your home, and that, that could literally be a friendly visit. That doesn't mean that you have skilled nursing Age 90, that's a whole different demographic, right? And that's a whole, that you're probably talking your most frail uh, and really maybe a higher level of care needed to remain living independently in your community, right? So just this region is aging quite, quite rapidly. The other thing that I like to point out when you think about the, how we, we are changing as a region related to age demographics over the next 25 years or so is what the state demographer refers to as the end of the demographic dividend. As a region, we were fortunate for many, many, many years to have lots of working age people <laughs> compared to older adults and to children, right? People that buy goods, generate revenue, that can support uh, people that maybe need services uh, in your community. So you are going from nearly an eight to one ratio in the year 2000 to less than three to one uh, in the year 2050. And there are a couple of dimensions to that. It is not only less workers per, per person that might ultimately need to tap into the revenue generated by their ability to spend money and drive the economy, but also less workers to support that older adult population, right? We are already facing very real workforce issues uh, for those that are, that, are, that are charged with meeting the needs of older adults when the workforce all together in terms of working age individuals is shrinking over the next 25 years, right? So an already acute issue that Jayla and her team think about every single day is simply going to get worse. I don't know how else to describe it um, over the next 25 years or so. Uh, I also want to sort of kind of give you a sense of maybe some of the slicing and dicing of the current um, older adult population um, in our region. Uh, and this has both the state and Colorado, the state and the Denver region, just to sort of see if there were any uh, uh, dissimilarities between uh, the two. But really, a pretty big disparity when it comes to those over the age of 65 living below the federal poverty line, based on race and ethnicity. Right? Pretty consistent, Denver to the state, but a, a rather uh, large chasm between sort of minority and the percentage of minority population over the age of 65 living below the poverty line and um, their fellow white alone, non-Hispanic uh, older adults. Uh, this population of also state and in the region faces some pretty significant housing challenges. So it's sort of the common way that this is viewed as this idea of cost burden status. Are you as, a, as, a, as an owner or a renter spending more than 30% of your income on housing? If you are in that situation, that means you are making choices every single month between housing and other goods that you need to remain in your home and to, and to thrive um, in your life. So pretty consistent state and uh, the region, but you can obviously see the huge disparity between what owners and renters face, right? If you are an older adult in this region renting, two thirds of you are paying more for your housing than you probably should be to be able to meet your other needs, whether those are healthcare costs, food, travel, all the other things that you want to try to do with your household budget. Uh, another issue that is that has really kind of been on, on the rise, really in our region, but throughout uh, the country over the last um, decade or so, is grandparents responsible for a grandchild, right? Thinking that you, you were in some ways maybe past a stage in your life where you were a caregiver for someone under the age of 18, um, and yet we are seeing that increase, right? A quarter of folks um, in our region, 60 plus, see themselves as responsible for a grandchild, right? That is no small task. Uh, I, I, I tell the story all the time, I do not have children, uh, but my wife and I have friends that have kids, uh, and we were visiting with some recently that two children, age three and five, we were with the couple with the children, there were four of us, I was exhausted after one day. <laughs> and that was four adults for two children. I was like, how do you do this? I do not understand it. So imagine if you are 70 years old and sort of have an assistive device and are trying to think about the other things that you have to do to make sure you're taking care of your yourself. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I'm going to cover, you good with this still? Um, 
I'm going to cover a little bit um, from that community assessment survey of older adults uh, because I think it's um, some pretty important information. And, and the, the thing that I really want to leave you with is we do that survey at the regional scale, but it is also statistically valid at the county level. Uh, and we do have instances where we act, have actually sort of bought up the sample such that there are municipal level uh, versions of this survey as well. I, I, I feel like I always have to balance the need uh, conversation with the reality that, that older adults are economic drivers in this region and I don't want that to get lost on folks. Um, this, this reports out sort of the economic contributions of older adults in the last three versions uh, of the survey. Uh, so think about that. In, uh, in the year 28, uh, 2018, you're looking at close to, what is that, probably 11 and a half or $12 billion worth of economic contribution from older adults, whether that is paid work or unpaid work. Uh, think about in your communities, who are your volunteers and who are helping your community through unpaid service? Oftentimes, they are older adults. At the same time, retirees also drive the economy, and they, they, they require all sorts of services. And this is not just meals on wheels and the things that you think about uh, from uh, maybe Jayla's shop's point of view, but this, this is financial planning. These, these are professional service type needs that this, this population also uh, creates demand for. Um, so I'm going to get into some very specific questions from the Community Assessment Survey of Older Adults. Again, statistically valid survey. Um, this population is rooted in your community, right? It was really interesting to sort of, sort of hear Brooke talk about the changeover um, and, and their housing stock. But when we, when we do the survey, this number has been consistent every time we've done it. Half of the folks that respond to the survey have lived in their community for more than 20 years, right? So they are rooted and invested in your community. Uh, we also asked them, how likely are you to retire in your community? Unfortunately, that number has been going down over the last three surveys. People are seeing themselves less and less likely to be able to retire and to live successfully in this region. And that should frankly be alarming to, to all of us. Uh, speaking of alarming, and I'm sure Jayla will bring even more drama, I'll, I'll stick to the like chart drama. Um, so again, <laughs> The, the last three versions of the survey, starting with 2010 as the top bar, um, 2018 being the bottom for each of these uh, questions. The best version of this is all of those bars extending further to the right. Hopefully your eyeballs tell you they are all going the wrong direction, right? And that's, think of this community as a place to live and that gap between community place as a place to retire. Happy today, paid, maybe have, feel financially secure, very nervous about the realities of having to transition to a fixed income and make things work um, in this region. Uh, despite the, the great services provided by the AAA and other community partners, people are concerned about the quality of services uh, to help them uh, stay in their community. Unfortunately, more bad news. Uh, just look at the first one, the, the, the availability of, of affordable and quality housing. Only 13% of people over the age of 60 that responded to the survey felt there was excellent or good opportunities to find quality and affordable housing in the region. Not a good number. And it, again, every single instance here is ultimately trending in the wrong direction, despite all of our best efforts. This one is one that sticks with Jayla every time we do the survey, right? She's very focused on making sure older adults understand the services that are available to them because a the service isn't any good if you don't know it's there and you don't know how to access it, right? So just despite that really earnest focus over many, many years, engaging many, many community partners, only half of, of older adults really um, feel like they are informed and understand the services uh, that are available to them. Um, and again, trending in the wrong direction uh, in the sense of feeling that, that they, um, the information that's available to them is, is sort of in that excellent or, or good uh, uh, score. So again, despite our best efforts, trending in the wrong direction for, to connect people to services. And I throw this is also from the, from the survey, and I throw this in just kind of it's, it's, this is more curiosity to me more so than anything. So this is a question about frequency of internet use. Right, use the respondents, 85% uh, use the internet for email, texting, video to communicate. Go all the way to the bottom. Less than half use that same resource where many, many people are going to find resources for whatever need that you have are using that to find information about community resources and events. 
So we, we talk a lot about this notion of digital divide, but in some ways there's a digital divide with this population between use of the technology and the tool and using it for a purpose they really think can be helpful for them as they try to find services that are available to them and their community. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dalo to wrap us up. Um, dramatic, because this is a dramatic situation, isn't it? See why I have a hard time sleeping at night? <laughs> so as Brad said, we did a community assessment survey recently. And along with that, we did a bunch of community, uh, community conversations all across the region. And we asked a number of questions. The first question I asked was, um, what are challenges that you're facing today? And these were the top 13. I couldn't get, I mean, they were cited so many times that I couldn't get to 10. Um, transportation being the number one issue. And, and that's kind of interesting as we heard the earlier conversations um, uh, this evening, right, about transportation and bus service. Um, nutrition, being able to buy and get nutritious food. Help with yard work, home maintenance, just among uh, a few. Assisted, finding assisted living that accepts Medicaid in the region. It is very hard to find that. Uh, those of you who have been that, on that journey with your parents, uh, those beds are full. Dealing with scams and fraud. This was a big one that I heard more than I've ever heard before. And actually, when we looked at the data, we saw a significant, about a 19% increase in the region in the last two years. Then I ask about what is your community doing to support your aging? What are they doing for you? And I was so happy to hear this because what I'm hearing is communities are getting us and they're responding to their older population. I heard a ton about the Buck Center in Arapahoe County and the services they offer. Gilpin County residents talked about how Gilpin County Services offers nutrition, transportation, and even engagement opportunities. Services in Douglas County, a whole bunch of services offered by Neighbor Network. Um, heard a lot about the uh, Aurora Center for Active Adults. There are more and more libraries throughout the region that are developing specialized program for older adults um, uh, uh, that includes like how to use um, your, your smartphone, uh, you know, how to access services. So that's really awesome. And then we heard about local transportation services that, that have been in existence, but some popping up, the circulars like in Lone Tree and Littleton. So most of the participants in my community conversations were between 60 and 70. We did have some older adults, but I said, now think about in 10 to 15 years, what are those services that you think you're gonna need? They talk about transportation again, being a big issue. A lot of talk about transportation. Accessing transportation, um, the fact that bus service has gone away as light rail has come in, first and last mile issues. Um, how do we get groceries, right? How do we get, okay, I can get, but I don't have anyone to help me carry in the groceries into my house. I can use Uber and Lyft, but they don't help me. Quality of care and good health insurance was a big issue. And finding services when they need them. One of the things that people said is, oh my gosh, there are so many services out there for older adults. I don't know which ones are good, which ones are credible. You know, you heard about all the frauds and scams. Should I trust that? Should I not? Uh, it's very confusing, overwhelming for some people to try and navigate the whole uh, uh, service um, options that are out there. So then I said, okay, let's compare what they said in the community-based or in the community conversations to what's actually happening right now in the AAA. The kinds of requests we get um, uh, in our information and assistance uh, center. The number one right now, and it changes. A couple years ago, it was all about housing. That was number one. Right now, it's about public benefits. Medicare, VA, Social Security, how to qualify for old age pension, those types of things. 
The second most common is actually advocacy, which surprised me. Um, we do have the ombudsman program, which protects the rights of people that live in nursing homes and assisted living, and there's a fair amount of that. But it's also, also legal issues, frauds and scams, accessing services, landlord-tenant disputes, a lot of landlord-tenant disputes, as I was just talking with Jessica about. Um, the fourth was in-home services, which includes meal prep and get help with dressing and bathing and setting up medications, but it's also yard work, heavy housework, home maintenance, things like as simple as changing a light bulb. Think of a person, the oldest person you know that's still living at home. How do they change their light bulbs? And what happens when they can't change their light bulbs, right? You know, living in the dark, can you read your medicine bottle? And then the fifth most common request in information assistance right now is for transportation services. So why am I sharing this with you? Because if we understand what the needs are today, we're gonna have a pretty good understanding of what the needs will be tomorrow and in the future. But we're gonna need a whole lot more of them. We already have waiting lists in most of the service categories that we provide as well as those of our contracted service providers. I was just talking with Carrie Erickson about transportation in Douglas County. They can't keep up with the demand. What happens when our 75 plus population triples and in Douglas County, even bigger, right? What happens? Well, bottom line is we've got to find we, we need more services, and that means we need to develop more funding streams, which includes private and public partnerships, which we haven't done a lot of, but we have got to get in this space. We're gonna see a significant increase in our population, and I bet we don't see that much in our federal and state funding. So how are we going to serve these folks? We can't put them in nursing homes and on Medicaid. That is not a sustainable financial model. And you'll learn more about that if you attend the uh, board workshop. So our services, the AAA services, have been proven to save healthcare dollars. So we need to promote and leverage our experience and get in these conversations that are happening at the state and the federal level about reducing healthcare costs. And there's lots of them going on, which you'll learn about. So I hope you're coming to Saturday's board workshop because it's really um, an opportunity to talk this, about this more. We have an all-star cast of presenters that includes um, Rich Morrow, our federal lobbyist, Mickey Farrell, who's here tonight, um, AJ Diamantopoulos, who's on my staff and running the uh, Accountable Healthcare Communities Grant. Um, we are gonna be talking about the challenges that we're having at the federal and state level funding healthcare how the AAA can be a part of the solutions that are being developed, the opportunities that are available for Dr. Cog, and how we need to change our business, the way we do business, in order to capitalize on those changes. And then we want to talk, we want your feedback. And we want to talk about ways that you as our board can help. Any questions? Questions, yeah, um, Ms. White. That, the slide you had that had the 17 lists of needs, I, you probably said this and I missed it, were those prioritized or just? Um, yes, they were prioritized in the way they came in this time, yeah. The, the one before yeah. that, so transportation yeah. was number yeah, one. number one by far. Director Olson. Sorry, I don't have my name tag out here. I couldn't find it over there. Um, thank you for this again, and this is a really critical issue and something I'm not sure why I'm really passionate about as well. Um, do you have, uh, maybe because I'm aging, I don't know, uh, 
We all are. Do you ha <laughs> not as rapidly at us. <laughs> um, <laughs> so do you have, and I'm a geek on some of this, so if you don't have this tonight, it's fine. If I could get it by email, that'd be perfect, and maybe others would. But do you have the methodology that you use both for the assessment survey and then the qualitative work and what the end was, sampling size, where yes, it was? Yes, I do. We have that. I can send that to you. That would the be whole, wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Director Dick? Yes. Um, I talk to people all the time that don't believe that the population is aging. Fortunately, I'm not. I'm six months away from being 85, so I'm, hey. not, I'm not old yet. I'm not getting old, not soon anyway. But this is, it's not about me. It's about you folks. That's what you're talking about. And this is not gonna get better. There are no good answers. We talk, I talk all the time to people who are aging, and some of them are much younger than I am and are facing very dire circumstances now. I don't know with the cost of housing going up and the scarcity of the housing, and I really don't believe that we'll play anywhere's approaching get a even, forget about no, getting ahead of the thing. 20 years, it'll be a, the same problem. And that's when most of you will be older than I am. And and you won't remember everything. <laughs> I really... We won't remember this conversation. Sometimes I don't even remember what I'm trying to say. But I have had the great privilege of serving with wonderful people who care about who we are and who we will be in the future. This is gonna take a lot of hard work and I thank you very much. And I really would like to talk to you about coming in for council. They don't read anything to speak of. They don't study. I wish they would listen to what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Dr. Walton. Thank you so much for this wonderful information. It, it, I just try to soak every word in every time you are sharing with us. Um, City of Lafayette is uh, just the beginning of this summer started our comprehensive plan and I've been attending the stakeholder meetings that we've had over the summer. Um, hopefully there will be many more conversations that we'll be having. And while there are seniors who tend to attend those types of meetings rather than, you know, a more youthful bunch. Um, I'm not hearing a steady drumbeat of aging issues and certainly not hearing the urgency that it warrants. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to build that in as we continue through the comp plan because I just, it's so important. I think a lot of people aren't aware of this. Thank you for that. You gave me chills because what I was thinking about is when Brad and I started these conversations, what, nine years ago, um, there wasn't a lot going on. You, you all are also part of the solution. And the changes you've already made, I already see impact um, in what you all are doing. And you all at the local level can make things happen faster than at the state and federal level. So you are such a critical piece of this, these solutions. Um, and I, I, I really do have chills thinking about all the stuff that you've already done, but we have a lot of work to do together. Are you having white papers that are city or Yeah, we do. As Brad said, we have a, a lot of information. Not not so much city uh, as county, but um, on our website, you want to talk about that a little bit more? Because city, if we had these profiles, it's it's you something did. we could at, for which we could advocate. Yeah, so like, as I mentioned, that community assessment survey of older adults is done every three or four years. It is always statistically valid at the regional level, it is always statistically valid at the local, at the, at the county level. Um, but then we give folks an opportunity to, to buy up that sample so that you can have a very specific uh, so at the jurisdictional level, at the municipal level. So I know we've done that in Littleton and Centennial and some other places in, in previous versions of the CASOA. 
and what since I was given the mic, I'm going to do one quick plug uh, that's sort of building on uh, Director Walton's comment. Doug mentioned the funding opportunity that's out there right now through the Rose Community Foundation. Uh, it is about helping you start the conversation at the local level. This is a very tricky conversation uh, for any number of reasons because how the aging of the population impacts your community is really far ranging, right? So when we help communities with, the, with, these, with this conversation, we are talking about planning, public works, housing type issues. We're also inviting your human resources folks to the table, right? The local government workforce is one of the oldest sectors of, of workers of any type of employee uh, in the entire country. What happens in five years when you're in, most of your workforce begins to retire and you don't have succession planning or they are want to be active in your community but they don't necessarily have an outlet? So that is specifically what uh, that Rose opportunity is about, is to support the very early stages of having that age-friendly conversation at the local level. I, yeah, Julie. Dr. Mullica. Thank you so much. And really, this work is really amazing, and I, I really appreciate um, all of this. Um, aging is something that's very important to the city of Northland, as you probably heard this morning, because and there, because so many of our seniors are our original homeowners. Yeah. And so it, they're so special to our community. Um, and there's tons of them. Like everybody has a handful on every block and we all know who they are. And so we've done a really good job as a community to try and pitch in, but there's so much more work to do. And so I'm really looking forward to the workshop this weekend and then really just interested in how do we start this conversation? How do we kind of move forward? Um, because it's, it's a very, very important um, conversation to have. In. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you. All right, moving to the next item, it is item 14, Metro Vision 2020, retrospective analysis of goals and accomplishments. Mr. Calvert. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mr. Chairman, as Brad is put, pulling that up, I. It's like I said in our executive committee meeting, you're going to hate me this evening for all the presentation. And John says, we're going to hate you more than we already do. Um, <clears throat> he was joking. It was a joke. Right? Tend, yeah, he I, was joking. I tend to no, joke. But, <laughs> yeah, we, we do have a lot of presentations and a lot of time dedicated to this day. And because it is built up for our board workshop, and uh, the last one was, and this one is also. So please bear with us. Thank you. Hello again. Brad Calvert, uh, Dr. Cog. Uh, uh, Doug took part of my intro. Yes, uh, I'm going to run through a lot of slides. It is to, it is so that you don't have to have this background at the workshop on Saturday because we're going to have another very big conversation on Saturday afternoon, and some of this background is important for you all uh, as 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 board members to 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 understand a little bit of sort of the history uh, that ultimately we'll be sort of reflecting on in a conversation about more the more uh, uh, recent uh, MetroVision plan. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of slides. I will also, the other modest reward, I don't think I have any quiz questions related to this presentation, <laughs> but there's a lot of background here that I think is important for you to know. And I, um, I'm going to hammer through 20 years of planning in like 20 minutes. So you know that you're getting like whatever below is above top level uh, high points, that's what you're getting. Um, I hate to introduce my bias into the room is what I hope your key takeaway is, but your key, your key takeaway is yes, this region has ongoing and, um, and emerging challenges and issues that we have to work through, but if you take a step back and look at what the board was talking about in the late 90s and the plan that they adopted uh, that laid out a vision for the year 2020, it is hard to come to a conclusion that is not we have been tremendously successful. So that, that is the reason why this board spends a lot of time talking about key regional issues because when this region puts its mind to accomplishing something and writes down what that is and collectively works towards a shared outcome, there's a really high probability that we are going to achieve it. So that is the really big uh, takeaway uh, for this presentation. As Doug mentioned, a lot of this is really kind of a primer uh, for uh, the, the workshop on Saturday. Uh, you can see kind of the little tagline there on the bottom of the slide. Um, 
When you walk into this room, I think you are encouraged to put your regional hat on, and I would encourage you to keep that regional hat on, but I'm giving you express permission to put your local hat on for a while as well, uh, because today's conversation, as well as the conversation um, on Saturday, is really about how do we organize a structure uh, that is really focused on local contributions and your community towards regional outcomes. Right, so think as I'm walking through things that are really sort of oriented towards the region, how much this resonates with you locally because you're gonna be having a very similar conversation uh, at the workshop. So a little bit of background on the MetroVision 2020 plan. Um, the slide is absolutely uh, correct. Uh, the plan was adopted in July 2020, but for the sake of full disclosure, the original version of that plan was adopted in 1997. The board went through three kind of series of, of, of very quick adoptions and amendments in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Uh, I'm gonna lean a little bit on, on the 2000 version of this plan for the presentation in part uh, because uh, the 1997 version of the plan relied on long-term population and employment forecasts that were generated in the early 90s that after the boom in the mid 90s in this region were frankly way off. Uh, so really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about some population and employment uh, estimates and foundational planning assumptions from the 2000 plan and kind of compare it uh, to where we are today. So that's really why uh, 2000 is kind of, kind of an important uh, date for here. Uh, for this for tonight's presentation do not worry about the lower right hand of that slide other than a lot was going on in this region in the early mid and late 90s that was not only about this board and regional stakeholders coming together to talk about the future of the region but had federal and state um, inputs into that conversation as well there was really just a lot happening uh, and so the plan at the time was reacting uh, to a lot of those things Another important point to understand is it's very difficult to, uh, to talk about a, the, the earliest version of the MetroVision plan because this board has adopted five or six versions of that plan since 2000. Every time the board adopts a MetroVision plan, you really, you, that resolution actually says you're replacing the one before it, right? So understand that we're talking about sort of a planning process that's dynamic. So even though I'm sort of time stamp stamping this to 2000, there have been lots of things that have happened um, in the intervening time. So just quickly, uh, the core elements from the MetroVision uh, 2020 plan, and I'm gonna cover these very quickly. Uh, most of these will, will sound uh, pretty uh, familiar, so extent of, de uh, of development that's really about kind of our urban expansion as a region, uh, open space, freestanding communities, uh, a balanced and multimodal uh, transportation system, urban centers, and environmental quality, all really sort of uh, issues that this board has been talking about um, since the beginning, frankly, of, of the board, of Dr. Cog's existence, but certainly uh, since the MetroVision plan uh, was something that the board adopted. Uh, if you see on this slide kind of that, qual that, that call out box is a quote that is something that appears directly from the plan just to kind of give you a sense. So really the board at the time was trying to understand uh, how the implications of, uh, that the implications of growth were substantial and raised significant questions, right? They, they were wondering how does this region accommodate 1.3 million people and 900,000 new jobs in a 20 year period, right? So that, that was sort of the foundation of, of, of what the board was wrestling with at the time. So we've got a couple of slides that actually compares those long range forecasts to really kind of where we are today. So they were wrestling with the right issues um, as so, sort of the bottom line, right? When you compare what that plan worked from, from a set of assumptions related to population growth, we're really only off by about 60,000, right? So the region really had a, a really good sense of economically uh, and in terms of how attractive we were going to be to people and jobs. Uh, so they were planning for the right things and planning for the right uh, magnitude. If anything, the, the rosier picture was on the job side of things. Uh, the region actually under uh, forecasted jobs. We had about 200,000 more jobs in the region today uh, than were forecasted or expected uh, in the year uh, 2020 when this was done in the early 2000s. So really, we've all sort of experienced, um, obviously, some of us have probably experienced a few recessions during that time, but in general, uh, a pretty active and robust recovery um, in the region uh, over the past uh, five years in particular. So I'm gonna walk you very quickly through those core elements again, just providing background. The one caveat I do wanna mention, um, unlike the current uh, MetroVision plan, 
There are very few instances in the 1997 or 2000 version of the plan that set future targets that are really easy to measure against, right? A lot of, a lot of it was really more statements of a desired future and less about how would we measure progress uh, going forward. So with that, I've got a cherry picking some things that I think are illustrative of what you might think of as progress. And these are just objectives uh, sort of excerpted from the plan. I, I, won't, I, I won't read them all to you. You can sort of uh, read them for yourselves. Uh, really focused on uh, compact development, um, thinking about uh, reserving areas for urban growth in the future. That's kind of, this plan was the beginning of the urban growth boundary program uh, here at Dr. Cog. One of the things that uh, actually did have some numbers or targets associated um, in the plan was that plan really emphasized the role of the central business district um, in our region's growth model, right? How important it was to have a healthy and prosperous uh, central, central business district and laid out some goals and aspirations related to, to um, housing and jobs within the CBD. Uh, basically, we hit that uh, target on the housing side and, and far exceeded uh, the job uh, picture on uh, the employment side. So in some ways, we've created an even more robust uh, job center at the center of the region. If you've spent any time with me over the last few years, you've seen this slide. I only mention it as kind of a reminder. Again, what the board was reacting to at the time was immense gro growth pressure and a question as to whether the urban expansion of the region, the ability of this region to accommodate that growth uh, was something that, this, that was tenable to the decision makers at the time. So Dr. Cox staff and your staffs at the time uh, assembled all the local comprehensive plans, your visions for growth in the, in the mid 90s and really kind of came up with an urban footprint that was well over a thousand uh, square miles and the board at the time just said that's not what we want in this region. There's too many things that are important to us that we might have to sacrifice to, to ultimately support uh, that footprint. So one of the things that they did is they created that urban growth boundary program. Um, this is where I admit that the, the board, I think that, I think I had on, um, that sev the board established a 747 square mile target uh, for urban development in the year uh, 2020. This is when I admit that trying to go back and, and redo that exercise is very difficult. The board spent the better part of a decade fiddling, that's a scientific word, with that definition. So it's really impossible to go back and try to redo that exercise. So we were looking for a proxy to at least give you a, a visual. What you're seeing on the map um, are that 2020 growth boundary um, in a yellow, at least it's yellow on my screen from my angle, I can't tell what color it is up there. Um, and in the blue, again, my screen, the sort of central uh, is the uh, urban development at the time in 1990, using kind of a general proxy that's been around, which is one dwelling unit per acre. We can, we can quibble as to whether that's really uh, urban uh, style development, but that has been a pretty consistent definitional uh, norm throughout the urban growth boundary process. So yellow, how much we wanted to grow um, in the future, blue, what existed as urban development in the year 1990, and then going out to 2016. So add, adding that, that orange using that same uh, analysis, right? So not only did we, the, the board had a conversation to shrink the assumption from 1,000 square miles to 747 square miles. If you observe what we have done in terms of a growth in urban footprint over the last uh, 20 years, we're well short of even the target that the board set um, at the time uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the plan also focuses on freestanding communities, uh, really zeroing in on the role of Boulder, Longmont, Castle Rock, and Brighton, and, and, and how the region grows uh, going forward. You can see some of the attributes that were associated with how uh, these communities would contribute uh, to the region's growth going forward, out to the year 2020 in this case. Uh, very focused on this idea of jobs housing balance, right? That uh, sort of predicated on, the, on this notion that if that if people and jobs are co-located or located near each other, that is, a, that is a different circumstance than jobs located in the center, center of the region and housing located uh, f far distances fr from that. Um, and so you can see kind of the takeaway at the bottom of the slide. Uh, at the time, uh, early 90s, uh, these places had 1.4 uh, jobs for every housing unit, uh, an aggregate amongst those four. Uh, communities and and the board at the time of the plan set a very similar goal. Let's hold that line. Uh, it has actually gone backwards a little bit. Uh, there was and that is really about the reality that these four communities 
have really been kind of flat when you look at them 1990 to today in terms of total number of jobs. They got hit pretty hard by a couple of recessions. Uh, we actually, they peaked in the sort of, um, in the 2000 time period in terms of number of jobs and are really kind of back at that number uh, today while adding 50,000 housing units. So that's really been kind of where that has played out from a, from a numbers uh, standpoint. The, the slide that you saw before, the freestanding communities really does emphasize this idea of geographic separation uh, between those communities and the, and the rest of the region. And just a few sort of examples of, of that reality that in some ways has remained. Uh, Boulder County um, has been uh, obviously very uh, ambitious in, in, in acquiring open space within the county. Uh, Brighton uh, and Adams County have been working a lot on uh, observing agricultural land in that um, area of the region, creating that, that separation. And then obviously Castle Rock has just really unique topography that, that creates almost a natural uh, separation as well. Uh, a little bit about open space, one of the other uh, core elements. Um, you can see sort of some of the key uh, things that the board uh, talked about at the time. Uh, obviously, our open space amenities as a region are, are really a, a hallmark and, and in many ways an economic driver uh, for this region. So comparing 1997 to 2017, I will give you the takeaway. Federal land, which we think of as a big piece of this region, remained relatively stable. I would be hard pressed to think of a region in the country where the, the local governments and your partners have stepped up to acquire as much open space as happened in this region. Uh, the board set a target of 28% of the land area being protected as open space. We are at 34%. Blew what was probably an, an ambitious goal completely out of the water. Uh, we can thank your communities and the voters for sort of long-term uh, support of protecting our uh, region's natural resources. To kind of give you an example of how this happens, I reached out to some partners of the Trust for Public Land and said, just tell me, give me a few examples. And they sent me a few things. And all you really need to know here is read the in partnership with, right? So this is, this is uh, a, an acquisition of, in the North Floyd Hill uh, area. Five, six partners involved uh, with an acquisition of a 110 acre uh, uh, piece of property. S same story in an Adams County uh, example that they, that they sent me. This region is very committed to this issue and these things do not happen overnight. Oftentimes these things are decades in the making to find a willing seller, get the money together, find who's gonna manage it, all that sort of stuff. So this region has obviously clearly been committed uh, to this issue for a very long time. Obviously not surprisingly, uh, a focus on, on transportation issues. Uh, the second bullet, provide high capital uh, new facilities. I'm pretty sure they mean high capacity. I don't really know what that word would mean otherwise. Uh, so I, I'm just, it's straight from the plan, but I think it was maybe something that wasn't, wasn't caught. Uh, you can see um, enhance and appeal non-motorized non modes, implement bus service uh, where no rapid transit exists. I mostly, so this is, I've got two sort of images from, from the plan, one of a future roadway network and one of a future transit network. Um, I really want to sort of emphasize this quote directly from the plan. Uh, Metrovision emphasizes rapid transit and bus service in the central portion of the region. New roadway lanes will be provided primarily in suburban areas. Seems like a quaint distinction these days, doesn't it? Like it just feel like just the conversation that obviously you had earlier, but these were the marching orders uh, in, in the late 90s. On the roadway improvement side, there's no point sort of going through all of these. Um, many of the projects um, uh, illustrated in the plan have been completed. Some obviously have not for a variety of reasons. That could be funding uh, considerations or really kind of maybe a, a change in priority. There has been an evolution of these projects to make them more multimodal uh, in nature, uh, both through sort of the design uh, and development of those projects, particularly sort of our larger <laughs> infrastructure projects, but also through this board. As, you, as you've been making investments in roadway facilities over the years, you have emphasized the importance that they should also bring other multimodal elements to the table as well. You spend a lot of time sort of on the issue of, of transit service in the region, so I won't spend much time on this, but I think it's important to know. So this map kind of overlays the map that you saw previously and kind of what's been done with the fast tracks uh, system. This plan predates the vote, right? So in some ways it's, it's sort of a, a different dynamic uh, when you really think about the conversation this region has had about uh, transit since 2004 compared to maybe the mid 90s or, or late 90s. Sort of related to that, interestingly enough, the plan does emphasize uh, the potential of Denver Union Station, and, but you'll see on the quote, 
it very specifically focused on uh, that facility serving as a multimodal hub. Check mark success. What it really sort of fell short on is recognizing the ability of that uh, amenity to really drive economic development and, and private investment uh, within the region. So what you're seeing on the slide is sort of a 2004 image and a 2017 image. And there is no telling how many hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, both public and private, that we are talking about that occurred in a relatively small piece of ground um, over that 13-year period. A few uh, transportation uh, metrics and, and goals just for you to kind of take in. Um, uh, we've actually done relatively well, pretty well, on sort of the air quality side of things. I know we have still ongoing challenges. Maybe not so well on the vehicle miles traveled, and obviously we talked a little bit about um, traffic fatalities uh, this evening uh, as well. The low point for this region, which I guess I would, should call the high point uh, in terms of number of fatalities, was in 2008, about 160. We're actually now uh, uh, well over 100 uh, more than that in our most recent observations, so really not trending in the right direction. A few other uh, measures and metrics uh, from the plan, um, I probably won't spend much time on this. In general, they are all going the direction that, that one would presume the board at the time wanted these to go. Uh, I will leave it up to sort of your individual uh, uh, observations as to whether you think that that has been enough of an improvement or if there is still more improvement that might be needed. Uh, that plan also set the stage for urban centers, uh, sort of this notion of, of compact urban development happening in, in, in locally designated centers around the region. Uh, that was really kind of where that conversation in terms of a new growth model for this region uh, began. So we have 105 urban centers in the region, uh, uh, basically representing about 1% uh, of the land area. So a little bit about sort of how these uh, centers have, have fared in aggregate uh, relative to the rest of the region. And do note you're looking at two different time periods on the housing side versus the employment side is sort of just a data thing. We actually, going back to 2005, unemployment can place very specific points. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do that uh, prior to 2005. Sort of a weird numbers thing that they both ended up at capturing 11% of the share of the region's growth in those issues, uh, in those areas um, during uh, the time periods that are indicated on the slides. Um, I always use quotes around new jobs. Uh, it is impossible to know whether a job is new or not. When you look at it, it may have just simply relocated from other parts of the region. You can pretty much guess when a housing uh, unit is new. So 1% of the land area capturing 11% um, of the growth during those time periods, so performing relatively well. Uh, the plan, uh, I mean, getting close to the end, uh, the, uh, the plan also spends uh, a, a fair amount of time talking about environmental quality. Specific, it, it notes the air quality issue, but this plan really very specifically focused on water quality um, issues uh, as well. And I'll mention what, the reason for that is at the time, um, Dr. Cog was responsible under federal and state statute for regional water quality planning. Uh, in fact, we as an organization created uh, uh, a clean water plan that was used in state and federal decision making, particularly in sort of in the permitting process for uh, wastewater uh, treatment facilities. We actually stopped that function. We no longer serve in that function. That, that function was reverted back to the state uh, back in, in 2010. Sort of stepping into that, though not really related, but just kind of for purposes of bringing it forward, is obviously the state has really focused on, on, on water planning at, at the state level, both from a supply and a, a quality uh, perspective. Um, so that has been really something that has been obviously kind of the key conversation about uh, where the region stands uh, related to water resources. So again, I thank you for indulging 20 years of sort of planning history. And all, again, all I want to leave you with is if this board commits yourself to something, comes up with a shared set of issues, uh, we are in really good shape uh, to achieve them, particularly when our member governments and, and your community partners are committed to a shared set of, of outcomes. And that's really what we're going to be talking about um, at the board workshop uh, on Saturday afternoon. Thanks, Brad. Uh, any questions for Brad? Sure, yep. I appreciate it. We'll move on. Uh, item 15, committee reports. Uh, report from the stack. Uh, uh, Ms. Jones is not here. Is um, oh, uh, Director Partridge. At least it, as it was not able to look up tonight. So the stack for the July 26 meeting announced that uh, CDOT announced that Heather Paddock has been named the CDOT Region 4 Regional Transportation Director. Region 4 includes Boulder and Weld Counties. 
There was a presentation by the Front Range Passion and Rail Study by the Project Director Randy Grauberger. And if you have not seen it, that will be uh, presented to Dr. Cog at the September 4th work session. And a special note, wanna, uh, maybe we could give a standing ovation or just tell it, I think that uh, we did do a standing ovation to our own Jacob Rieger, who is the vice chair of that commission. So, everybody stand, sit, good. Yeah, there it was, I saw it. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, there you go. Proxy. All right, thank you, Director Partridge. And, uh, oh, I'm not sorry. quite, oh, not that. Or did you want me, I'm sorry, I didn't end with that for Jacob. Well, I thought, I thought, uh, I mean, very, Jacob was like the encore. I know, it was I like should've. the closer <laughs> for you. I did not plan well. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and last, the NCDOT report on the statewide plan effort. <laughs> And they have met not only with Dr. Cog and RTD, but they have met with all of the Dr. Cog sub-regional forums for that. And they expect to release that statewide plan in early 2020. And Mr. Chair, would you like me to give the MAC report also? Why not? <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah, why not? Actually, there is no MAC report. Because <laughs> <we don't. laughs> That's good news. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all all right. right. Metro Mayors. We will meet this Friday in Jefferson County, though. All right. Thank you, Director Partridge. Uh, Metro Mayors Director Atchison. Uh, Metro Mayors Caucus was held on August the 7th and uh, had a pretty filled agenda. Uh, many of you know Daniel Ritchie. He's um, part of the Raise the Bar group from a couple of years ago. And uh, Daniel is was there to talk about referendum CC, which is, will be on the ballot this year in regards to the debrucing uh, for the state level to put money into education, not only K through 12, but higher education and transportation. So that'll be on the ballot uh, in November. Reeves Brown uh, came in to update. The meetings are going on around the district and around the state on building a better Colorado. Kelly uh, Brug from the Denver Metro Chamber brought in uh, a presentation on Prosper Colorado. And then uh, something that uh, I had talked to some of the executive meeting about is we are getting some national inquiries now in, in Westminster and the developers, Builder and Chapa made a presentation to the Metro mayors on what it takes to get developed, financed and build workforce housing and i've asked the executive committee to take a look at uh, having them come into dr cog this was a five-year process to get a project built and about two weeks ago we opened it at the new downtown for westminster 118 units the day the ribbon cutting opened the door they were 75 percent leased they have filled out the leasing workforce based on a family of four Area median income of $56,000. One bedroom unit, washer and dryer, all amenities, $550 a month. Three bedroom, two bath, washer dryer, $1,625 a month. Compare that to market rate. I would tell you in Westminster alone, I could use another 3,000 of those units. And it, it's very important that um, we, we look at how we partner with these because the tax credit availability is shrinking. It's not even staying stagnant. Uh, the other one I think that was important to the region is the uh, flex fund. And I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Starker to tell you a quick update on that. The uh, flex fund is a, is a project of the Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, Housing, uh, Homelessness and Hunger Committee. And it is a, a small grants program that uh, provides <laughs> Uh, damage deposits and uh, landlord damage repairs and similar things in order to keep families in housing so they don't become home. Ch Chaffa presented a, uh, a check for $15,000 to uh, MDHI, the Metro Dimmer Homeless Initiative, who is our administrator on that program and provides that funding to uh, partners such as Family Tree, the Action Center, and a number of other community agencies that make those funds available to um, to families. Um, we have raised uh, about $220,000 this year, mostly from, uh, partially from the uh, member uh, member cities, and we have almost 100% participation. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, 
uh, but also with private donors, uh, Chaffa, the uh, Denver Foundation, the Daniels uh, Fund, and we hope to continue the program through into the future. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, next report out is um, Advisory Committee on Aging, Ms. Sanchez Wine. So we had our meeting last Friday. I gave the Advisory Committee on Aging uh, the same presentation that I gave you all in July. My goal is to keep everybody on the same page. I also gave it to my staff so that we're all working from the same information. We also had a presentation about our accountable health communities um, program. It's the demonstration project, bridging clinical care with community-based care. Um, uh, our, our project manager, AJ, gave a really good presentation and an update on where we were. I hope to be able to offer that to you in the next few months so you have an understanding too. Uh, really good news. Uh, we have been invited to present uh, to the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine about our ac accountable health communities. Um, so AJ will be participating, and uh, AJ and I and Mickey actually are gonna go to Washington the second, third week of, of September, and we're gonna combine some Hill visits with that and uh, uh, listen to AJ uh, speak at the National Academy of Sciences. Pretty cool, huh? That's my report. Thank you. Uh, next is report on the Regional Air Quality Council, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had a regular meeting on, uh, on August 2nd. Uh, we got a 2019 ozone season update. Um, and I'm, I'm sure most of you guys have heard by now that um, we are more than likely, got, we are gonna be bumped up to serious non-attainment for the 2008 ozone standard, which is not terribly good news. Um, and uh, we just, I just heard, I think yesterday, day before yesterday, we blew the standard for, for ozone um, for the last three year average. So that's uh, not particularly good either. But we do, we have some issues and challenges, certainly as it, as it relates to air quality. Um, we had an update on the strategic planning exercise that RAC is going through. Our very own Jerry Stiegel is facilitating that discussion with the RAC. We appreciate his efforts. Um, we got an update on a, a couple proposed regulations, regulations 20 and the zero emission vehicle standard. Of course, the ZEV standard passed out of, uh, uh, was approved by AQCC um, uh, late last week. Um, and we also got a very educational uh, presentation about hydrogen fuel cell technology. I thought that was pretty fascinating by a gentleman uh, who's a former uh, aerospace engineer. So that was interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A uh, report from the E-470, Director Teal. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> uh, E-470 board met on August 8th, and um, under the Engineering and Roadway Maintenance Department uh, section, we had a number of uh, IGAs that went through, Aurora Water, Commerce City, um, the ARTA development off 38th Avenue, as well as um, uh, uh, approval of a road widening contract kind of for that section north of the road widening, north of the Smoky Hill area, kind of getting up to I-70. One of the more interesting things probably for this board was uh, the board of E-470 considered a hazmat road analysis, route analysis task order, namely going ahead and studying adding E-470 to the road network as a hazmat route. It is not a hazmat route at this time. Um, we were after coming up to a 30 year anniversary of a big hazardous material incident uh, at the good old mousetrap that happened in the 80s when uh, uh, the Navy was shipping some torpedoes and it pretty much shut the town down for uh, an entire day. That came into consideration for a, for a hazmat route for E-470. There are member communities of the E-470 board that are actually very opposed to E-470 being designated a hazmat route. So this doesn't begin, this doesn't make E-470 a hazmat route, but it does do a feasibility study on adding it at a later time. We talked a little bit about the insurance broker selection, and then uh, the executive director briefed us on uh, issuing an RFP for toll plaza redevelopment. Because for those of you who've ever driven E470, you've noticed that over, well, like me, over the last 20 years, the technology has changed pretty radically. 
and a lot of those total plazas, uh, we don't need them in the current configuration. So that process is starting up. That concludes my report. Thank you so much. Uh, report on fast tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you. Um, the RTD Planning Capital Programs and Fast Tracks Committee met earlier this month on August 6th. They had no action items, they had three updates. One, reimagine RTD, and as previewed at, in, uh, by Executive Director Rex, Dave Genova will be at the work session for this body, for the Dr. Cog Board, next month to discuss that in more detail. The board heard a quick real estate and joint development update from staff and then a presentation on the regional bus rapid transit feasibility study. So I'd like to give you about 10 or 15 minutes on the bus regional BRT study right now. Oh no, actually sure. you all yeah, just had okay. that earlier this <laughs> evening. Ahead. So very similar presentation um, to what you received this evening and that concludes my report. Thank you. All right, we have a couple of informational items, uh, board collaboration assessment results, and Denver Regional Data Brief. Uh, please feel free to look at those at your leisure. Uh, the next meeting is um, September 18th, 2019. Is there, are there any other matters by members? Not, at 8.45, we were adjourned. <laughs>